Hello. <laughs> uh, well, I don't know if I'm really prepared, but it's my life, so if, if I get it wrong, it's <laughs> shame on me. Um, I want you to know how important Santa Clara was to me, and I have to back up on the story a little bit. I started rowing at 14 years old at Slack Rowing Club in San Diego. Uh, one of the people here today, Joy Stockton, wave your hand, Joy. That's a gal I met the first day I rode, and we've been best friends all this time. This sport demands so much of you that you just enjoy the people so much, and they're lifelong friends. And even though we don't see each other all the time, I can come back with my group right now and, and just take off like we never left off, so it's, it's wonderful. When I started rowing, I had no idea that this sport would lead to the Olympic team. Men's rowing has been in the Olympic program since the very first uh, games, but women weren't introduced to rowing or the, into the Olympic program until 76. And uh, we ax just all these series of events happened to me. My coach um, that we got at ZLAC was from Vesper. He was from the Ivy League. He understood rowing, and he made us national champs the first year we rowed in the junior category. And I was hooked with my friends and coxswained all the way through. Now, I am tall for a coxswain. Usually they're very short people. I'm five foot seven, so I had the ability also to row, or at least the opportunity to row and be in boats as well as coxswain, because I am also very skinny. I'm the tallest rower, so therefore the skinniest coxswain that ever competed at the Olympic Games. <laughs> Um, I, when I started to row again um, at San Diego State, I was rowing flyweight and won a national medal as a flyweight rower, um, earning one of the few people who ever weren't won a national medal as both a coxswain and a rower. I didn't think that I would make an Olympic team, but just so many series of events lined up that in 1979, when I came to Santa Clara, I started on the men's crew. And what is the difference between a really good coxswain and a great coxswain is self-confidence. And I tell you, you know, I'd had five years of experience now, three years rowing, two years rowing, three years coxing. I come on this men's crew and they think I walk on water. They, you know, they're just all walk-ons, and so I know what I'm saying when I say you're late to catch or, you know, you need to slow your slide, all these things that coxswains say, and they took it in, and to have such people listen to me and, and care what I say, I tell you, it did great things to my self-confidence, and I really think that the Santa Clara crew, the men's team with Craig <laughs> stroking that boat, is the reason, one of the reasons that I went on to make that 1979 national team. Another thing that lined up is that the coach was from the West Coast. In a, in a sport that's very dominated by the Ivy League, um, Bob Ernst was from the University of Washington, and he was intent on finding and identifying talent on the West Coast and bringing it back east to try out for the team. He had selected me, he had selected uh, another coxswain from Cal, uh, another uni uh, University of Washington co coxswain as well, as well as some others that were from the West or East Coast. And to make a team, it is very subjective for the coxswain. You know, it's not like we get along across the finish line first. Um, it is off the water you're judged as well as on the water. And it is a difficult time because you're always being judged and that's a hard thing to go through but this this men's team here at Santa Clara really did pump up my confidence and when I was selected in 79 I'd gone through a series of camps and it's kind of like you know they tack your name up on the board every time there's a cut and if your name's still there then you're you live another day kind of thing and I went through camps in Tennessee, and then I went to Princeton, New Jersey, and then I went to Dartmouth, and then I went to Boston, and I kept making those teams, um, kept making the cuts, 
and was on the 79 team in the 1980 Olympic team. And if you remember, we boycotted the, the 80 team. And it was truly one of the hardest things I went through because our team was selected, we went to Europe, we trained, we did everything. But then that day that everyone went to Moscow, we ended up on the White House lawn meeting Jimmy Carter. And uh, the women's rowing team was the team that was the most adamant against the boycott. They had actually mobilized. Anita de France is a name you might know in sports. She's on the Forbes 500 list as the most powerful woman in sports in the world. She was on that team, and she actually sued the US Olympic Committee. When time came to be with Carter, um, most of those women wore shirts that said 1980 Olympic ro women's rowing team, and on the back it said Jimmy Carter's threat to national security. <laughs> I was one of the few that did not wear that shirt. I was on a three out of a team of 40 women that shook President Carter's hand. And it was a very polarizing experience. It was so polarizing, I thought that I would not be accepted again on the women's team. And in 1981, didn't even entertain the thought of training. In 1982, it was just through my prayer time that I felt the Lord was suggesting that I should try out for the team. <laughs> and I was like, well, oh, you know, I've got to get a job. I got, you know, it's an expensive thing to live on the, go on the East Coast for six weeks. And I kept getting this message in all my quiet time that this is something I should try out for. And I have to say, rowing has been a spiritual journey as much as anything else I've ever done. Um, and so finally, after much soul searching, I quit my three jobs that I was doing <laughs> and went back east and made cuts and made cuts. And it was down to me. And the final person was a woman named Chris. She was the Wisconsin coxswain. She'd been in the team in 1981. They had placed better than they'd ever done internationally at fifth place. And I didn't think, um, I thought I did well, but I was nervous. And when that final name was put on the tack of the board, I looked at it, and Chris's name was there. And I remember this, I don't know if anyone's read The Shack, but there's a talk about an encounter with the Holy Spirit. And the, the encounter is something that lights are bright, uh, a lightness of being, the sky opens up. I am on a bike going up a steep hill at Dartmouth College, and I am ranting to God saying, oh my God, God, I told you, you told me to try out for this team. And I'm crying, of course, and with not a beat a difference, I felt the Holy Spirit saying to me, I told you to try out. I didn't tell you you were going to make it. <laughs> <laughs> and that's something that I've learned. I mean, it was just this incredible experience. And any time I have doubts about God, I think about that time. Because I felt his presence and his loving kindness so much that my tears of bitterness were turned into tears of joy. I uh, thought, oh my gosh, you know, I've learned my lesson. God doesn't care how I end up. He cares how I go about things, how I do things. The journey is the important part. And I came home with that lesson and put it to use right away. I got balance in my life. I just had one job instead of three. I, I enjoyed life more, and I didn't stress out about things. And sure enough, prayer time comes again, and God is saying, you should try out for the team. Oh, are you kidding me now? This woman's Chris has now done this, you know, two years in a row. It, it would be hard to knock her off. And, uh, but came time, I went back east, went through all those camps, came down to the final thing. And this gal, Chris, is a great gal. And, you know, we're in front of Bronco fans. You know, 
I can say this to you. I have to weigh 99 pounds for my sport. So I'm, you know, dieting and I don't look much better when I'm dieting, right? But I tell you, Chris and I were waiting for this final thing and we went out and we got a six pack of beer. <laughs> and I drank up one and, you know, it doesn't take much. It still doesn't take much. <laughs> But I went home and I wrote this poem that I'd like to share with you today. And it says, uh, for the first time in my life, I hope to sit, um, I aim to escape. For the first time in my life, I aim to escape um, into hopes to sedate my growing anxiety, my hopes and my fears, knowing that in hours I'll be reduced to tears. For whether or not I make it, it seems, the emotions will flow because of the dreams. Both Chris and I, we get along, and that makes it easier for me to be strong. But when one of us is picked and the other goes home, who will it affect? Who will have grown? Winners are not reflective, and losers are. And in the end, the loser goes far. Yet I want to make it and be the best. I deserve it this year more than the rest. Yet that type of thinking is just what is wrong. Who knows what is best, short term or long? Just leave it, Kelly, and don't lament. Winners and losers are terms stagnant. What really matters is the effort put in. You've done your best. Consider it a win. I went down to the boathouse a little while later, and my name was on the board. 1983 just set it up. 1984 was a breeze to make that team. Winning the silver medal was so exciting. We, had, we, were placed, we were supposed to get fourth, and having 10,000 people chant USA, it was amazing. We came in second, won the silver medal, and uh, a wonderful crew. But um, I just wanted to know, and if anyone, you know, we all have challenges, we all have disappointments, we all have failures, we all have mistakes. But if we just sit with it, sometimes God uses those mistakes or those failures and make something great. And so that's my story and thanks. Thank you for this honor. I really appreciate it. Thank you, John, for thank you. Thirty years at Santa Clara. Nobody gets to do that. The average life expectancy of a college division one men's basketball coach is four years. I was here for thirty. Thank you, Carol. <laughs> because the impact that all of the athletic directors and admin had and the coaches and people here on campus, the way that it, they affected me and it helped me grow, I wanted to do that to the, to the student athletes. And it's cool nine years later after playing professionally and having a crazy professional journey that I am able to be back here. 